In our ongoing studies in Chapter 4 on protein structure, we want to consider in this lesson methods that we can use to isolate a single protein from a mixture of proteins and how we can then determine its primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Perhaps the most commonly used method of protein isolation is chromatography. The name comes from the fact that initially it was used to separate colored compounds. In chromatography we have a stationary phase and a mobile phase, and in this case we're looking at the example of column chromatography, in which our column is packed with a matrix of porous beads, and they're retained in the column by the presence of the centered disk pictured at this line at the bottom of our column here. It's solid to support the matrix within the column, but it's porous enough to allow the flow of liquids through by gravity flow. And that buffer is our mobile phase. We apply a solution to the top of the column, and it per percolates through the column by gravity flow. We're going to look at size exclusion chromatography, where we're going to separate molecules based on size. In the example here, we have small molecules pictured as the blue spheres and large molecules as our yellow spheres. And so we start with a mixture of these two. This is the green band at the top of our column. We apply it to the column, and as the buffer flows through, these molecules will separate based on size. In this case, the larger molecules will elute or come off the column first, and that on the far right you see that yellow band at the bottom, and the smaller molecules last. The reason for this is illustrated on the far left. Here we have a close-up and cutaway view of those beads. We see that the small molecules are small enough that they fit inside the beads, whereas the larger molecules are excluded from the beads. That's the idea of size exclusion. Because of this, the large molecules are not retarded in their flow and they reach the bottom first, whereas the smaller molecules are delayed by their presence inside the bead. Imagine this analogy. You leave your home, you go directly to the bus stop. There's nothing to retard or delay your progress there. And so that would be the example of our large molecules. It goes directly to the bottom of the column. However, imagine instead you leave your home and instead of going directly to the bus stop, you go inside and outside of all of the buildings. You'll get there at a delayed rate, and so that's why the small molecules come off last, because they spend in some time inside the bead, and that delays their progress through the column. So again, in size exclusion chromatography, the larger molecules elute or come off the column first. Another type of column chromatography that we'll look at in class is ion exchange. For now, let's consider that we've isolated our protein, and we want to determine its mass and also the relative purity of the sample that we've produced. So we'll use a technique referred to as SDS PAGE, which stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Let's take that name apart a little bit. The STS is the sodium dodecyl sulfate that's pictured at the top of our screen here. It's an ionic detergent that coats the protein. It coats it with a negative charge. Because of this, it denatures or unfolds the protein, so every protein in this has a linear shape, and so we've equalized the charge to mass ratio. We're going to take our solution of protein that has been coated with SDS, and we're going to apply it to a gel matrix. This gel is composed of polyacrylamide, which is a mixture of acrylamide, that's the bottom left, and bisacrylamide on the right, and so it forms this porous matrix, similar to the size exclusion matrix we saw in the previous slide. In this case, however, the matrix, the pore size, is much larger. Remember, our proteins are coated with negative charge, and so when we apply a current, it will move towards that positive electrode. That's the electrophoresis part of our name. In this case, however, the mobility is inversely proportional to size. That is, the larger molecules move slower, and that's because the pore size does not restrict movement. Instead, it's a function of the frictional coefficient. So the larger the molecule, the greater the friction, and the more slowly it moves. So we ha here we have an illustration of a stained gel. We stain it with a blue dye so that we can visualize those proteins. And we see our larger molecules are the slower, and the smaller ones are the faster ones. In the far left, we have a series of molecular weight markers, and that allows us to determine the size of our protein, reasoning that if our band 
a protein here migrates the same distance as that molecular weight, that must be the size of the protein. So we can determine the size in this way. We can also see the relative purity. Look at lanes 2 and 3. We almost have no other protein available or present, just the one protein band. However, in lanes 4 through 7, there's a mixture of proteins. The bands that stain more darkly are those that contain more protein. So in this method, we can determine how pure is our sample and get a relative idea of the size. Once we've isolated our protein, now we want to determine that primary sequence. One of the common methods that's used is referred to Edmund sequencing. We're going to use a reagent called phenyl isothiocyanate, that's our red molecule up here, and we're going to derivatize our peptide. So here's our peptide here, here's our first amino acid. We have a free amine group here, and so by nucleophilic attack, we're going to add that PITC molecule to our peptide here. We're going to do this in the presence of anhydrous trifluoroacetic acid. This is simply a mild acid. And that breaks that peptide, hydrolyzes that peptide bond here, but only the amino acid that's been derivatized. So we clip off that first amino acid, and each of the 20 amino acids has its own spectral signature. And so we can detect the presence of which amino acid we produced by that first cleavage. You'll notice in this method the rest of our peptide is intact. So now we can go through another round and determine the identity of the second amino acid in our sequence. We can do an automated sequencing and therefore determine the sequence of multiple amino acids in our peptide. There is a limitation here though. We have to have that free amine group and so it, the pH conditions have to be just right to make this happen. We're also limited because we can only determine a certain number of amino acids and eventually our peptide breaks down. Another method that we'll look at for determining the primary structure is spec mass spectroscopy. We'll look at that in class. Imagine we've determined our primary structure. Now we want to determine the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. That's X-ray crystallography. We're going to purify a protein to almost 100% and we're going to crystallize it under ideal conditions. At the top of the screen here we have pictured crystals of a particular protein. Now we bombard those crystals with a beam of X-rays and because we have a regular array of atoms within that crystal, it's going to those X-rays will diffract and produce a very specific pattern and of course that pattern is very complex, that's pictured on the bottom right here, but we can analyze that by a computer program and it will give us the three-dimensional map of the electron density. We can then convert that by use of a program into a three-dimensional model. All of the models, whether it's the ball and stick, the ribbon diagrams, or the space filling models, those all came about from X-ray crystallography. In our next video lesson, we want to consider if there is another method that we can use to isolate protein from a mixture based on some factor other than its size.